Welcome to the Rabbi and the Shrink. This is Dr. Margarita Guri, also known as Dr. Red Shoe, and everyone's favorite rabbi. Jonathan Goldson. <laughs> and the good rabbi has yet again found us another amazing resource for the Rabbi and the Shrink. We have with us Dr. Melissa Hughes. Welcome. Thank you so much. It is so great to be here. Hi, Melissa. Hi. We are, we are delighted. Dr. Hughes is an interesting soul. <laughs> she has this company called the Endrick Group. And, and I know I'm going to brag on you for a little bit, but uh, I want to make sure that you say, I love the story of why you call this the Endrick Group, your business. Why? So I, several years ago, uh, about 12 years ago, I decided to leave this position that I was in and I was going off and starting my own business because I just, it was time for me to embark on some new endeavor. And at the time I had reached out to my mom and dad and said, what do you think I should do? I mean, it was a big, scary step forward, right? And so I had a conversation with my mom and dad and my dad said, make the decision and don't look back make the decision and don't look back. And so I was time to like figure out who I was gonna be. And Andrick is my father's name. And, and so in his honor, I called it the Andrick Group. And I was able to get my father business cards for the first time in his life because uh -huh. he, worked at a, a, he worked at Goodyear Tire and Rubber for 43 years and he never had business cards. So I named him Chairman Emeritus, and the very first business purchase I made was from for Vistaprint for business cards for my dad. Uh, <laughs> that's so nice. I think that your story for how you got started and our our beginnings aren't always so beautiful. No, but well, that was certainly a beautiful beginning. Yeah, and I think there's a message in that that you know when we feel that we are part of a continuum. You know, there's a, there's a Jewish uh, folk story about a fellow who's traveling from Jerusalem to Tiberias, and he comes to a crossroads, and the and the direction sign is lying on the ground. It's broken. So what does he do? Well, he doesn't know where he's going, but he knows where he came from. <laughs> so he picks up the sign, he puts the arrow to Jerusalem back the way he came, and now he's able to figure out where to go from there. So when we have a sense of where we've come from, it helps focus us on the future and gives us a sense of purpose and direction. Well, yeah, and I sure hope your father our, also gets tremendous pleasure from it. I hope all that our listeners have that Endrick arrow, um, arrow that they can they can follow their own arrow. All right, so you can tell that our guest today thinks about things differently. In fact, she's an expert on how we think and our brain and bringing out the best in people. She talks about making a group of individual rock stars into rock star teams has an amazing way of looking at it. I love, even her website is different. It's Melissa Hughes, Melissa with two S's, Hughes.rocks, R-O-C-K-S. Speaking of her brand, I mean, that's just lovely. And her LinkedIn profile is Melissa Hughes, PhD. One of the things that you do that other people don't do is you use your cutting edge research to back up your understanding from when you were a fourth grade teacher. Please start us, uh, start us off on the beginning of the journey and that led you to eventually a series of books that help us all on our journeys. The Happy Hour with Einstein, The Happier Hour with Einstein, Happier Hour, Another Round, and then the Gratitude Journal that goes with it. So how did it get started from fourth grade? So I was a fourth grade teacher in a very small school district outside of Akron, Ohio. And I taught the first year I sat down with my mentor and we did kind of a post-mortem, like what worked well, what didn't work so well, what do you want to work on and come back stronger and better, you know, next year. And my overarching question was, how can I possibly be an effective teacher if I don't understand how the brain learns and all of those factors that impact cognition and problem solving and creativity and all those things. And that was really where the journey started. And, you know, I'll fast forward about 20 years and I, I continue to do the research and I learned a lot about uh, brain function and cognition 
as it relates to kids in the classroom. But then I started having more and more conversation with people who were not in the classroom, who were in the boardroom and who were in the conference rooms. And what I discovered was learning how to learn and learning how to improve cognition becomes even more important after you leave that fourth grade classroom. Like all things being equal, organizations who understand how to really grow the collective intelligence of their groups, that's what separates the best of us from the rest of us, right? Because we now all, I mean, years ago, if you had access to the internet or you had specific tools that cost a lot of money, then you had a competitive advantage against your uh, against your rivals. But now I mean, we all have the same access to information. The difference lies in how we use that information and how well we're able to access the information, what we need when we need it. And so, you know, I, I'm so lucky that I am so passionate about the brain because literally we all have one. And what I found is that it doesn't matter what industry it is or what you do for a living, we all want to, our brains to work at optimum capacity. Wow. So if I wanted to be a bad boss, what would I do that unmaximizes, that minimizes the brain? Oh, okay. Well, if you wanted to be a bad boss, um, I think the, the number one thing to do to really undermine the intelligence of your people and the creativity, not just intelligence, but the creativity, the problem solving, collaboration, because let's face it, none, not one person in your organization will know everything. The organizations that really rock are the organizations that know how to create teams of teams, right? Because if you think about the org chart, the traditional pyramid uh, shaped org chart, one person at the top, and then there's a couple more, and then like all the little people are at the bottom. In that traditional model, learning starts at the top and it trickles down, but it doesn't go the other way. In teams of teams, everybody's a learner, and everybody's a teacher. And those are the kinds of organizations that really value the strengths and contributions that people bring to the table. So the, in order to do that, there has to be a certain level of psychological safety. And I've just, I just wrote a white paper on psychological safety in the virtual work workplace, because now that we're in this very kind of weird hybrid, some people are back in the office and some people are staying remote. Um, those leaders who are really paying attention to how do you meet the emotional needs and the psychological needs of your people, those are the, those are the organizations that are really thriving. And where do um, we find this paper? I have not read that one. It is on my, it's on the resources page on my okay. website. So, All right. I will um, look it up. Um, but, you know, psychological safety is, is in, it fits into Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We learned about Maslow yes. 102 years ago. And what we know is that we need, to, we need to belong. We need to feel like we belong to be able to contribute. And in order for us to feel like we belong, we have to know that we're not going to be ridiculed or embarrassed or ostracized for asking questions, for making mistakes, for not knowing answers and for challenging the status quo. So, you know, innovation, take any company that's interested in innovation. Innovation is all about challenging the status quo. Like that is innovation. But if you're in a company where you're not allowed, you know, the seven most expensive words uh, in the business is, this is the way we've always done it. <laughs> And if you, if you are not working with, if leaders are not looking at their people and saying, oh my gosh, uh, help me understand how we can do this better. Instead of saying, this is how we do it. And there are so many leaders out here, out there who say, here, let me show you how we do it. Instead of saying, 
let me ask you to come share feedback about, is there a better way to do this? I mean, what strengths and skills do you bring to the table that we didn't have before you? You know, that's like kind of the big thing. Like you hire the best and the brightest people, but if you don't create the conditions for them to be the best and the brightest in your organization, did you really hire the best and the brightest people or are you just paying them to be quiet? if they don't have the psychological safety to really contribute. And sometimes that contribution is not what the leader wants to hear. Sometimes that contribution is, hey leader, we've got an information sharing problem here. We could improve productivity. Let me tell you about the challenges in my employee experience so that we can fix it for everyone. Because if I'm having these challenges and it's a process or you know, a procedural thing within the organization, um, probably a lot of other people are having that problem as well. So those folks who view the organization as having a, a development mindset or a growth mindset, they're always, they're not threatened by, hey, let's fix this problem. Those folks that are all about the genius mindset, they don't wanna hear the problems. They only wanna hear what's working. And if they only want to hear what's working, they're never going to fix anything that's not. Right? One, of the, one of the most famous teachings of the sages is who is wise? The person who learns from every person. Right. And I love while that. there are some people that we only learn from through counterexample, um, on a more positive note, uh, everybody, I forget who says this, everybody knows something you don't. And particularly when we are in a collective and we presumably have the same mission and we have the same goals and the willingness, the, the, you know, the intellectual humility to say, there are things I don't know. And I'm perfectly happy to let someone else be my teacher. Mm -hmm. And we teach each other. And then we create a, a culture of constant growth and constant learning. And, and by the way, Dr. I have to compliment you on your question. The question was, what do you do to be a bad leader? You know, we're always here. What do you do to be a good leader? I mean, how many, how many articles have been? This is an article. Um, yeah, it's good to know what works. But sometimes it's even more important to know what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And what am I doing to that I think is actually a, 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 a defensible technique of leadership that in fact is sabotaging my whole project. Yeah, I mean, that's so true. I, I, when you think about uh, any problem, the best organizations have issues and problems and wrinkles and snags. It's just that's if they're learning and growing and stretching, they're going to have problems and issues and snags, right? Um, but if, a, if an employee goes to a leader and says, hey, there's a problem with the way we're doing this, and that leader shuts the employee down, now that problem is nothing, it is only an obstacle. But if the employee takes the problem to the leader and says, hey, there's a problem with the way we're doing this, it's, it's impeding our productivity, there's a better way we can do this. And the leader says, let's talk about that. Let's have a conversation about that. Now it's not an obstacle. Now it's a challenge to solve, right? And when we feel challenged, I mean, the brain loves challenge. When we feel challenged, the prefrontal cortex loves it. It's like, give me more, give me more, right? There's that sweet spot between not challenging enough is boring, too challenging is frustrating, but the Goldilocks rule, just challenging enough, we are golden, <laughs> right? And, and when, when leaders actually listen to employees when they raise their hand and say, there's a problem, and when people feel like they're seen and heard and valued for sharing that experience with leaders, now it's a challenge. And, and when we view it as a challenge, now we can put our best problem solving skills to use. Um, but until then, it's that unavoidable obstacle, can't get around it. And what happens is you just figure out how to bypass it. You don't ever solve the problem. You just keep working harder to work around it. And yeah. 
All right. So it seems like the brain so far, you said it, it needs belonging, psychological exactly. safety, yep. which is part of helping the mindset, you know, for the growth mindset, which I think you articulate very well, the growth mindset, which I'll have you address that in a second. What else does the brain love? Let's say we want to help our team grow. Give me an idea. What can we do to feed our brains and those of anyone in our sphere of living? So in, you know, in the teachers out there, your teacher listeners know this, the best way to enable a student to learn something is to task them with teaching it because you cannot teach something you don't know. So the best thing a leader can do if they really want to inspire building collective intelligence and get to the best of every, every person is number one, people need to know that what they do matters. That's number one. Number two, people need to know that what they do is valuable. And the best way to create value is to say, share that thing you do with someone else. Teach others how to do that thing you do. And one of the biggest downfalls of so many organizations who have very toxic work uh, cultures is the learning starts at the top and it trickles down to the bottom. And the people at the bottom never get to teach up, right? When, if you build that kind of learning community where the expectation, not just the opportunity, the expectation is that we all teach and we all learn. What that means is the people at the top do not have all the answers. They do not have all the information. They do not have all the wisdom. And the people at the bottom, their sole job is not just to learn what the people at the top are telling them to learn, right? A building a learning community says the expectation is that we all contribute and we're all recognized for the different contributions that we make. And I think the best leaders look for that. We talk about diversity and inclusion. The best leaders look for diverse contributions because, you know, if I can come to the team and say, Rabbi, no one ever figured out how to do that before. You're brilliant. Like, oh my gosh, all this time we've been doing it like this other way. And here you come along with this. And I say that in front of your peers. Well, now I just made a huge investment in your social status. And the brain loves that too. And I mean, remember, the brain can't differentiate between a social threat and a physical threat. So if we feel that our social status is threatened in front of our peers, which is very hard, very difficult, because we all want to be competent and confident and we want people to think that we can do our jobs. And when that is threatened in front of our peers, the brain treats it exactly the same way as if we were being chased by a tiger. Exactly. That's really useful to know because we tend to negate the legitimacy of emotional responses. Mm -hmm. and, and if I think, well, I'm not entitled to be feeling this way, then I just suppress my, myself and, and the, the issue just stays inside me and festers, or if I recognize it's a legitimate response, well now, okay, now it's something that needs, needs attention. Um, you, know, you touched on one of my real bugaboos, um, that diversity is not just about checking boxes. No. It's about diverse perspectives because we come from different orientations, different cultures, different mindsets, and together we can get closer to that 360 perspective that allows us to really have a fuller understanding. But if we're just trying to have representation, but uh, as, our, as our friend Helen Trumbull says, people hire for diversity and then they, they manage for sameness. Um, we're, 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 it's almost worse because <laughs> we've, we've included all these people and now we're not really including them. Right. And we're not giving them the opportunity to contribute. You know, one of my rabbis said that we all say it's better to give than to receive. If we actually believe that, then what's the greatest gift you can give someone else is the, the, is opportunity. the opportunity to give. Right. And that's so empowering and so, uh, and so exciting. And, and as you say, gives people that sense of value and contribution. 
Yeah, in the very beginning of the pandemic, I did some work with some organizations in the, in, in the hospitality industry, and they were really struggling with um, their people because, you know, we're open, we're closed, we're 50% capacity, we're 25% we're capacity, we're whatever, right? And, and then there started to be work, um, supply chain issues and all of those other things. And so what was happening was the stress of the unknown was becoming much more uh, dangerous than the stress of the actual pandemic. And people were, had, they were at a loss of control. There was no part of their life that they could actually control. I mean, that was really hard on all of us. Like we couldn't control what work looked like. For a lot of people, they lost their jobs. For a lot of people, they were doing their job at home with the dogs and the kids and the landscapers outside and the whatever, whatever, right? Um, but one of the things I told them was, if you want to give your people, the best thing you can do for your people is to give them something to do to help. Whether it's come in and we're going to take the next week, we're closed, we're going we're gonna to scrub out the walk-in coolers, whatever it is, right? And they looked at me and they were like, well, those people don't want to come in and work. I said, yeah, they do. They want to contribute. Because when we contribute, we feel like we have a sense of control. We feel like we have an ownership over the situation. So to own the situation, we have to not only own the solutions, but we have to own the problems. And a lot of times what leaders do is they take that problem solving piece out of the hands of the employees and say, we're gonna make all these decisions over here about things that impact the way you do your job. Well, that, that doesn't work, <laughs> that doesn't work at all, right? And, but if you want people to have an ownership over the organization and the goals, then you can't half, halfway do that. You have to do that, right? You have to let them own it all, own the problems, own the solutions, own the con conversations and, and let them be a part of the decision-making. So one thing that I loved about your TEDx talk, um, the whole thing about being a fraud, all of us, the three of us here and many in the audience have been dealing with uh, organizations and leaders and teams that have already gotten into the negative thinking. Uh, there, maybe they were excellent as an organization, maybe they weren't, but now they're festering in this negativity. You address that negative festering in a very positive way explaining it and then provide solutions. If you wouldn't mind giving us a top level explanation of, of what you said in your lovely te TED talk. Well, I, I'm, I'm gonna try to hit on what I think you're talking about, but you know, our, we are wired for negativity. That is an ancestral hand-me-down. So because we were constantly, we're constantly on the alert for danger back in the caveman days, that is what enabled us to survive another day. We were not, you know, blissfully basking in the beauty of the great outdoors. We were truly looking for danger. That's the other reason why belonging is such a strong need for us because people who belong to the tribe survived. And people who are on their own had a much harder time. So we are wired to connect with one another. So that is, um, uh, just a natural place for us to be where our, our brain always produces cortisol, which is our stress hormone. And that's a good thing because that is what prevents us from walking out into the middle of traffic, right? It's what keeps us alive. It is also what keeps us kind of on the alert for people we trust, people we don't trust, friend or foe, right? And, and I think what happens when we get in these spaces where it's all negative, all negative, there's a vicious cycle and there's a virtual cycle. The vicious cycle is the brain loves patterns. And so when you get stuck in that vicious cycle, like you wake up in the morning and you go, this is going to be the worst day ever. I can just <laughs> tell. And you get up and it's raining and then you spill coffee on your blouse and then you can't find a parking spot and you forgot your umbrella, see all of these things. If you get up and you start your day in the virtuous cycle, this is gonna be the best day ever. Oh my gosh, look, it's raining. I don't have to water my plants today. That's awesome, right? Um, 
do more bad things happen on those days that we notice them? No, we just notice them. We're, it, it, you know, I mean, we are not looking for the good things. So we really need to pay attention to where we're placing our energy. And when we get in that space where it's negative, 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 like it's really important to stop and go, hmm. In terms of imposter syndrome, these are all things I'm telling myself. These are all negative things I'm telling myself. And that's when you have to stop and say, would I talk to anyone else the way I'm talking to myself right now in these negative terms? And if not, if I can honestly say, no, I would never talk to another person this way. That is when I have to go, okay, it's time for me to stop the vicious cycle and jump into the virtual cycle. And the only way to do that is through intention, intentionally creating some good positive thing in your world. And the easiest way to do that is to show gratitude to someone else. Your brain actually gets more of the good stuff when you show appreciation to some other person than they get. Yeah, the Hebrew word for gratitude is hakar satov, which translates literally as recognize the good. Because if we pay attention and we look at and for the good in our lives, then the natural response is gratitude. Mm -hmm. And that does promote that, that virtuous circle that, that you're describing. Um, you know, I, re I learned something recently that, that has just really changed my outlook in a, in a very significant way, that the way our brains are designed, as I understand it, that we, we can't absorb all of the visual impulses that are coming at us. There's right. just way too much coming in that we would overload. So we are, our subconscious filters out what the subconscious has decided is important. And, and if we've developed the habits where we're focused on negative things, we're literally not seeing the positive. And if we are, if we've disciplined ourselves to take note of the positive, then the negative doesn't appear on a radar screen. So it's really a, uh, you know, a very deep process. And, and I'm sure you can explain this better than I am, uh, that we're, we're, we're actually creating our own mood based upon the experience that's guiding our subconscious selective perception process you actually explained that like spot on bam you that you did a great job with it i can tell you the science part of that is it's called the reticular activation system and i refer to it as the brain's bouncer you know the bouncer at the bar who decides whether you get to get in or not whether you're on the a list or not we have one of those in our brains and we tell the brain what we're looking for right and then so it's like have you ever thought I'm going to buy that. I'm thinking about buying that little red car. And then all of a sudden you see that little red car everywhere. Yes. Is it that there are more red cars on the road? No, the same amount of cars are on the road. It's just your, you've told your brain's bouncer that you're going to let that in because that's relevant to you right now. So to your point, if, if you're, all you're looking for is the negative, well then the brain is gonna let all the negative in. And we can only, we can only process so much. When, it's, when the inbox is full, all the positives, think of all the good things that we never notice because we're not looking for them. And it, yeah. if you think about it like that and you go, oh, well, all I have to do is look for them. It's really that, it's really that simple. I mean, it's science and it's your brain at work. And yeah, it's that simple. It's kind of cool. At home, Great. being refugees, I was always around people who lost a lot. And my parents had a very different take on it. They would appreciate your take too. Yours too, Rabbi. Um, and so when we'd complain at something, my mother would come up, give us a big kiss and hugs. Ay, que bueno. Now you have a chance to not only be grateful, but you're, Jesus wants you to find the good. Uh, what's your next step? And I'm thinking that's kind of good there, you know? So maybe it's time now, speaking of the next step, Rabbi, do you have the word of the day? And then we'll come back to our good doctor and uh, we'll ask her for uh, two things, the fun 
and the final words of wisdom. Rabbi? Well, I've been a little distracted in this interview because I came up with four words of the day and I couldn't decide which <laughs> one. <laughs> and as we were having a conversation, I kept going from this one to that one to the other one. And I think the one I've decided uh, to bring up is the word adumbrative. Adumbrative, adumbrative, which means serving to foreshadow or being faintly indicative. Never and heard of it. Neither had I. Um, but of course, what's the point of words that we've heard of before? Let's uh, expand nope. our vocabulary. But I think, I think uh, you know, Melissa, what, what you were just explaining, that idea of having a, you know, we're talking about a growth mindset, how about a foreshadowing mindset? And really we have one, whether we, whether we are aware of it or not, we are foreshadowing our experiences based on our expectations and based on our self-talk and based on our habits that we've gotten into. Um, one of the, uh, the, the great Hasidic figures of the past, um, he, um, his name was Reb Zisha. And uh, some students asked their, their, uh, their rabbi, you know, we don't understand. How is it possible to, to bless the bad? And so we'll go ask Reb Zisha. And as they, they traveled to see Reb Zisha, and they said, do you know Reb Zisha? Oh, Reb Zisha, he's such a poor man. He's suffering terribly. And, and oh, Reb Zisha, he's, he has all kinds of health problems, and he's in pain. And Reb Zisha has family problems. And, he, and they finally found Reb Zisha. And they asked him their question. How do you say a blessing on bad? He says, well, why are you asking me? Nothing bad ever happened to me. And, and it's not meant, the story is not meant to delegitimize suffering because there is genuine suffering in the world, but it does show us how we have much more control over our outlook and our responses than we might like to think. And that so uh, being a dumbrative is, is to foreshadow, let's, let's find a positive uh, expectation and, and, and an outlook that is going to lead to more of a of a positive experience for us. That's awesome. I love that. That is awesome. All right, so let's start with what is one fun thing that you're looking forward to? A new adventure, something interesting, fun, exciting? I am uh, just uh, several, maybe two weeks in, I am writing a new book and it is a different book. I'm very excited about this one. It is a goal setting, goal getting journal for kids ages 12 to 20. And the whole concept is a lot of kids have a very difficult time setting and reaching goals because that mountain seems so big until you go, well, can you just take one step? Maybe you can just take one more step. And so the whole concept of this book is um, teaching kids, young adults, how to take that big goal and break it down into smaller goals. Because one of the things that I have learned in, in my little life is that, um, you know, those people who are really successful are able to set and reach goals. And it's not that we are thinking too big, it's that we're not thinking small enough when we don't reach them. So take that great big goal, goal, goal and break it down into smaller chunks. So I'm super excited about that. Well, I can't wait to read that. That's exciting. I, I know some 60 year olds who might benefit from this. You know, everyone's been, been doing that. And um, how about one final word of wisdom, piece of advice, uh, some sort of call to action? Uh, I would say, I don't know, this has been such a great conversation. I could go on with you guys for another hour or so. But it's been I interesting think, and fun. Yes. Yeah. Just, just kind of, you know, in thinking about all the things we talked about, I guess my piece of advice would be, you know, pay attention to the limited resources in your life. And I don't mean the material things, the tangible things like limited resources, like attention, time, energy, because how you spend your time and energy and where you place your attention has a direct impact on the rewards of your life. So, you know, pay attention to how you're spending those resources and spend wisely. I love that, Melissa, because I, I really think that being able to set priorities 
is, is a key to success and happiness. I mean, we all have way more demands on us than we could possibly meet. Mm -hmm. And being able to filter out um, the ones that are, are less important and give our attention to the ones that are more important, important in, a, in, a, in an objective value way. Absolutely. Um, that really is going to give us that sense of, of fulfillment and, and achieved purpose. So uh, thank you for joining us. Please come back again and talk to us. Uh, we'd love to continue the conversation. And, I would love uh, to. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Wish you success in all your efforts. And then doctor, what's the last word today? Dun, da, 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 dun. The last word besides go to melissahughes.rocks, R-O-C-K-S. One thing that all of us have experienced in the teams and individuals with whom we've had the opportunity to, to coach or train or speak to in keynotes is that I think that when we're scared, I think sometimes the tendency is to hold on. So we stay in a job that is no longer suiting our needs. We uh, forget that our values are important to our positive sense of self, and we may accept changes to the quality of those values in our friends, in our workplaces, in our leaders, and even our own approach. And I think this is a great do-over. So let's do what the good Dr. Hughes suggests. Look for the positive. If there's something negative, look for the positive, focus on that. And if you can't turn it around, maybe it's time to make some changes in what we do. That let's not let fear be anything but an inspiration for growth and stop holding on. I always have that image of Homer Simpson reaching into the Coke machine and he gets the Coke, but he can't pull it out because he's holding on. And I get that image for all of us from time to time. So let go of the thing that's no longer serving you well and look for the positive. It's an undumbrative, the foreshadowing of the positive. Did I use that right, uh, Rabbi? Uh, I think so. Uh, uh, well, and, well and done, not, doctor. <laughs> I have no idea if I used it right, but we're trying to set an atmosphere here of growth. We risk falling flat on our faces so that we can enjoy the smell of the earth. So that is my thought. Thank you, Dr. Hughes, for being with us. It's really amazing. Um, I hope everyone gets to learn from you. And I wish you well in all your um, ad new adventures as Thank you... you Change the world one positive thought at a time. Thank you Every so much. My pleasure. Everyone be well. Thanks for joining the Rabbi and the Shrink. We'll see you the next episode. Thank you for listening to the Rabbi and the Shrink, Everyday Ethics Unscripted. To book Dr. Redshu, Dr. Margarita Guri, or Rabbi Jonasen Goldson as speakers or advisors for your organization, contact them at therabbiandtheshrink.com. This has been a Dr. Red Shoe production.